Thank you so much for such a nice introduction <laughs> of me. And thank you very much for inviting me here today. And I'm also grateful to all the audience here for coming to my talk. Okay, then uh, shall we start? Um, compared to other East Asian countries, Korea has scant historical documentation of its early history. This poses challenges for the study of the early history of Buddhism in Korea. Two historical texts, the Samguk Yusa, which you're looking at on the screen, and the Samguk Sagi are often used as the primary sources for the study of Buddhism under the Three Kingdoms and the Unified Silla Dynasties. But the relatively late compilation dates of these texts requires cautious use of them. Based on the archaeological data excavated from the unified Silla's twin pagodas, this talk attempts to conduct a comparative analysis of archaeological data and texture records in order to shed some more light on the history of early Korean Buddhism in unified Silla. Twin pagodas gained sudden popularity in East Asia in the 7th century. In the Korean Peninsula, they became an, es uh, an especially favored form of Buddhist architecture under unified Silla. Mm. The twin pagodas of the Kamunsa Monastery, is it working? Ah, okay. Completed in 682, can you hear me better now? Same? Oh, okay. Is the oldest surviving twin pagodas on the Korean peninsula. Kamunsa served as one of the state monasteries from unified Silla until the Goryeo dynasty. But sometime during the Joseon dynasty, the monastery was abandoned. And as this photograph shows, by the mid 20th century, only the twin stone pagodas facing each other east and west and the vestigial stone foundations of the monastery buildings remained amid farmhouses and rice paddies. So here in this, oh sorry, black and white photographs, you can see one stone pagoda and another here and then there were lots of farmhouses around there. Okay. The Kamunsa site was excavated in 1959 by the National Museum of Korea with the financial support of the Harvard Yanching Institute. This was the first modern archaeological excavation conducted by Korean archaeologists. Uh, my maternal side grandfather, Yun Mu Byung, was one of the four archaeologists who, who directed the excavation. In the course of the excavation, a sophisticated reliquary set was found inside the third story of the West Pagoda. Oops, sorry. Ah, so that one. Uh, this photograph was taken from the backside of the monastery site because from here begins a slope downhill so it's not easy to take the photograph from the, from the south. So here in this photo, this is west and this is east. Okay. A similar reliquary set was excavated from the east pagoda of Kamunsa during the restoration of the pagoda in 1996. We shall return to these reliquary sets later in this talk. Okay. Before discussing the Twin Pagodas of Silla, we should locate the Twin Pagodas in the larger East Asian context. Although the Twin Pagodas were a Buddhist architectural form uniquely developed in East Asia, its meaning and function still remain largely unexplored. In part, this is because most previous scholarly study of Twin Pagodas focused on discerning their origins. Instead of attempting to advance a new hypothesis on their origin, 
My research instead inquires into the agency that contributed to the sudden popularity of the Twin Pagodas in 7th century East Asia, its reception in different regions, and its ritual function and multifarious meanings. So uh, if you want to know more about the uh, several different hypotheses of Twin Pagoda's origins and their problems, you can ask me about it during the Q&A. Um, okay. As the focus of today's lecture is Korean Twin Pagodas, I will mention only one key point of my research on Chinese Pagodas. Uh, my research into texture records of the Chang'an city, the capital city of Sui and Tang, suggest that the Sui dynasty's imperial patronage of the Twin Pagodas probably contributed to the sudden spread of Twin Pagodas in the 7th century. During the Sui dynasty, Twin Pagodas were built under imperial patronage in at least four major monasteries in the capital. My research further suggests that the twin pagodas of the twin monastery complexes of Chuanding uh, Si probably played the dominant role in the sudden popularity of twin pagodas. The twin pagodas were built to commemorate the deceased imperial couple, Empress Wen Xian and Emperor Wen. The Twin Pagoda's symbolism of imperial couple was later manipulated by Empress Wu to legitimate her political power. In addition, as recorded in the supplementary biographies of eminent monks, when a copy of Chen Ding's Twin Pagodas were built in Mount Winmen in Henan province, new ritual functions were added and the new Twin Pagodas were used for ordination and precept conferral ritual in this local region. When Twin Pagodas were introduced to Korea about a half century later, their meaning also went through changes in the new local context. Uh, the first Korean monastery with Twin Pagodas was Sacheonwangsa, meaning the Four Guardian Kings Monastery. The monastery has not survived, but the stone bases of its twin pagodas still remain, uh, uh, still remain at the temple sites in Gyeongju city. The Samguk Yusa records a dramatic historical background of this monastery. According to it, in 670, the Korean monk Uisang learned during his stay in China that Tang China was planning to invade Silla. So he hurriedly returned to his home country to report the news to King Mummu. Following the recommendation of the high official Kim Chonjon, the worried king summoned the monk Myeonglang, who had studied Buddhism also in China. So there is the monk's name and uh, this is a story about uh, how, uh, how they built the Four Guardian Kings Monastery. The monk suggested to the king that they should build a monastery named Sacheonwangsa in the Xinyu forest and install a ritual place there. Due to insufficient time, the monk created a makeshift monastery with colorful silk textiles, made statues of deities of the five directions, and performed an esoteric ritual known as Munduru Bimilbab, or the secret ritual of Munduru, with 12 yoga monks. According to the Samguk Yusa, wind and billowing waves destroyed the Tang warships when the ritual was performed. After the war, Sacheonwangsa was provided with permanent wooden structures in 679. Here I need to point out that the Samguk Yusa combines myths and legends with historical facts, and it is often not easy to separate them. However, if one uses the text cautiously and compares its contents with archaeological evidence, some useful data may be drawn from it. 
For example, the Sacheonangsa site still retain a pair of stone altars with round holes. Uh, and those holes were used to place round wooden mudras used for ritual. I'm skipping all the details, so if you have uh, more questions about it, uh, please ask me after, after the talk. As I have already explained that it is very probable that the secret ritual of Munduru, which was a proto-esoteric ritual, was practiced in 7th century Silla in my two, uh, 2013 publication. I will not go into details in my talk today. Uh, it suffices to say that the twin pagodas in Korea built at this monastery played a role of backdrop of this ritual that was believed to protect Silla during the war time. Moreover, Sacheonangsa was one of the major three state protection monasteries in Silla. What further suggests the status of the Twin Pagodas of Sacheonangsa as religious symbol of state protection is the relief sculptures of guardian deities, which originally decorated the bases of the monastery's Twin Pagodas. Mm. Due to this, these multiple factors, it seems that the Twin Pagodas began to symbolize state, uh, state protection in Silla. This will be further proved when we examine the Twin Pagodas at Kamunsa. And this Sacheonangsa continued to serve to protect the state even after the war ended in 676. According to the Samguk Yusa, Emperor Gaozong of the Tang Dynasty sent an envoy to Silla in 685 to inspect Sacheonangsa since the emperor had heard that the monastery may have been related to the military victory of the Silla dynasty. In order to hide Sacheonangsa from the Tang dynasty envoy, the Silla royal family had the new monastery quickly constructed and showed it to the envoy instead. This new monastery, modeled on the Sacheonangsa monastery, was later named Mangdeoksa. Um, and this is the current site of Mangdeoksa. Uh, remaining archaeological data show that this monastery also had twin pagodas. This incident suggests that, uh, that Sacheonangsa had some ritual function that had to be kept secret from the Tang Emperor. The Goryeosa, or the official history of Korea, indeed records that the, that the above-mentioned secret ritual of Munduru continued to be performed at Sacheonangsa at least until 1074. Okay. By examination of the Twin Pagodas of Kamunsa, the second oldest Twin Pagodas in Korean history shows that the new architectural vocabulary began to assume more sophisticated meaning and function that goes beyond simple state protection. The monastery's construction was initiated by King Mumu, who led the victory in the above-mentioned Silla Tang War in 676. According to the Samguk Yusa, since King Mumu passed away before the completion of the monastery, his son, uh, his son King Shinmun completed the construction for his father in the year 682. King Shinmun named the monastery Kamunsa, meaning monastery of feeling gratitude, to express his gratitude toward his father. King Mumu thus became the founder and at the same time delegate of the monastery. My analysis of the reliquary sets excavated from the Kamunsa Twin Pagodas suggests that the East and the West Pagodas were indeed designed to have differentiated but correlated meaning and function. Each of the reliquary sets consists of an outer and an inner reliquary. So, equal, sorry, this one was actually found inside this outer reliquary and same here. 
and this inner reliquary uh, from the West Pagoda also had canopy above it like this one but uh, the canopy was not uh, fully restored so it is now separately uh, kept in the museum storage. The outer reliquaries have an image of one of the four guardian kings on each of their four sides. The most conspicuous distinction between the East and the West reliquary sets is found in the completely different sets of figurines on the platforms of the inner reliquaries. As for the East reliquary, small figurines of the four guardian kings and four monks surround the relic container in the center. This set of monks and guardian deities is not a typical iconographic motif for a Buddhist reliquary. So there is no other similar uh, reliquary uh, in, any, in any of the country. I mean, including Korea, Japan, or China. This is really unique uh, reliquary design. Why were they chosen to be the main visual motifs of this reliquary, and what do they represent? Considering the socio-political context of Kamunsa, founded by and for King Mumu, these figurines are strongly evocative of the above-mentioned secret ritual of mudra performed during the reign of King Mumu. As mentioned above, yoga monks performed this ritual. Despite their small size, the four monk figurines clearly show that their designers put efforts to differentiate their hand gestures and the implements in their hands, which seem to be certain mudras and ritual instruments. The figurines of the four guardian kings standing with the monks may also be related to the secret ritual of Munduru. As mentioned earlier, this ritual required the st uh, statue of the deities of the five directions. In 1965, a uh, Korean scholar Park Tae-hwa found that the secret ritual of Mundu, uh, Munduru was based on the seventh chapter of the Consecration Sutra preached by the Buddha. This sutra is the only one found to date which mentions a ritual named Munduru Pimilpop and, the ritual, and this ritual in the sutra also involves the Obangshin or the deities of the five directions. Okay. Uh, Omura Seigai suggested that this sutra was composed in the later half of the 5th century in Jiangnan in China and Michael Strickman studied the importance of this sutra as an early medieval Chinese apocrypha. The sutra explains that each of these uh, deities of the five directions has the shape of an armored guardian deity and is related to the four directions and the center. In 1990, Kang Ubang convincingly argued that the deities of the five directions in this ritual served to assimilate indigenous Korean religion with Buddhism and that they were indeed another form of the four guardian kings and India. Therefore, the Kamunsa reliquary's unique juxtaposition of the four guardian kings and monk figurines uh, monk figurines performing ritual is probably artistic recreation of the secret ritual of Munduru, which began to be practiced in Shilla just 12 years ago. In this context, it is noticeable that the relic container surrounded by these figurines was made in the shape of Mount Sumeru, the cosmic mountain which stands in the center of the universe in Buddhist cosmology. Uh, I would say it reflects the Bulgukto Sasang or the Buddha land ideology developed in Shilla in the 7th and 8th centuries which viewed Shilla as the center of the Buddhist world. In other words, 
The East Reliquaries Mount Sumeru, surrounded by the monks and the four guardian kings, can be seen as an idealized and symbolic representation of the Silla dynasty under the protection of the uh, state protect ritual. On the other hand, the inner reliquary of Kamunza's West Pagoda represents the Western Pure Land, the Buddhist paradise where most Buddhist believers wished to be reborn. On the pedestal of the West inner reliquary stand four figurines of children standing on lotus flowers, specially carved out of green colored stone. And this is Iko, sorry. And this is one of those four uh, small boy figurines. What is the role of these small children in the Kamunza reliquary sets? In Buddhist iconographic system, a small child on a lotus flower is the most typical iconography of the Western Pure Land, since it represents rebirth in the Western Pure Land. The four statues, uh, statuettes of heavenly magicians are also common motifs of the Western Pure Land. Considering the widespread usage of, these motif, uh, of the motif of rebirth in Buddhist art, it is rather surprising that the iconography of this reliquary has not yet been identified. Um, so, because, uh, because a Korean scholar argued that this one uh, represents the Nirvana scene, the Nirvana of Shakyamuni Buddha, uh, many other people are still following that argument, but I strongly argue that this is uh, the Western Pure Land. Okay. Why was this reliquary designed to be the Western Pure Land? In Buddhist doctrine, the Buddha is the, uh, is the awakened being who has escaped the endless cycle of death and rebirth. So the Buddha does not need to be reborn in Pure Land. Therefore, representation of the Pure Land does not commonly appear on reliquaries designed for Buddha relics. In order to understand the paradoxical design of this inner reliquary, we first need to understand how the East and the West Kamunsa reliquary sets were connected together through an ingenious visual program. The lid of the outer reliquary from the East Pagoda has images of four flying birds, each carrying a human figure on its back. So, echo. <laughs> so this lead uh, is this part in the east side. Okay. While the lead of the outer reliquary of the West Pagoda, so this lead is this part. Oh. While this uh, lead also has images of birds, they are no longer in flight. Instead, they are resting on lotus flowers, as if they, they have just arrived at their destination. And inside this outer reliquary is the inner reliquary designed to be the Western Pure Land. However, the human beings, the birds transported from the, east, uh, from the East Reliquary have disappeared. Where can you find those human beings in the West Reliquary set? One can infer that the children on the lotus flowers in the inner reliquary represent the rebirth of those human beings who had been carried to this Western Pure Land, since people who come to this paradise is reborn in a lotus flower. Small statuettes of birds are placed at the four corners of the canopy of the inner reliquary, as if to witness the rebirth of the human souls that they had carried. Okay. So, as I said earlier, this one also had canopy above it like this. And these are, uh, this is a diagram uh, drawn by the archaeologist who excavated this one. Okay. In addition, 
The east inner reliquary has a door on its western side, which may be another visual device to guide the soul to the western pure land, which is symbolized by the western reliquary. All this show that through the subtle variations of visual motifs, the Kamansa reliquaries visually embody the transport of souls from the East Pagoda to the West Pagoda. In other words, from this world formerly guarded by the, by the four guardian kings to the Western pure land filled with music and lotus flowers. The funerary works found throughout the wider region of East Asia also imply that the bird was thought to be a carrier of the soul of the dead. The most striking parallel example, however, is the 6th century Northern Wei sarcophagus of Prince Zhen Jing excavated from Mount Mang, Honan province in China, which was studied by Professor Eugene Wang. Both of the side panels of the sarcophagus show a couple riding a bird at the narrower ending part of the slab. So, aiku, ah. So here you can see two birds, right? Uh, and then uh, one person, its head, now upper body, riding this bird. And then another figure here with a top knot. And this figure is also riding a bird, right? Yeah. Um, where? Uh. According to Eugene Wang, this couple signifies Prince Zhen Jing, the occupant of the sarcophagus, and his wife. And the visual program of the sarcoph sarcophagus portrays their transport to the luminous other world. The bird is flying toward the square window on the left side. Having passed the window, the same bird appears again in the center of the slab but this time without the couple on its back. Instead, the couple appears in the square window engraved on the same slab, implying that they have just landed inside the window that symbolizes the mediatory gateway between this human world and the luminous other world. The role of the bird as soul carrier and the way uh, way how the transport of the soul is visually described on this sarc sarcophagus are extremely similar to those appearing in the Kamunsa reliquary set. This visual program of the Kamunsa reliquaries, however, raises further question. Why do we find a parallel visual program between Buddhist reliquaries and traditional funerary art? Does this visual program of the Kamunsa reliquaries indicate a specific person's rebirth in the Buddhist paradise or not? The historical background of Kamunsa may provide clues to answer these questions. King Mumu was a ruler deeply concerned about the military security of his country. After the tumultuous unification of the peninsula and the war against Tang China, which started with the conquest of the Baekje and Goguryeo kingdoms and culminated with Silla's victory in the Silla Tang War in 676, the instability of the newly annexed territories and rebellions by left subjects remained a source of continuous anxiety for the king until he passed away in 681. The Muno Wang Bommin article in the Samguk Yusa records that the king wished to become a dragon of the sea after his death so that he could continue to defend his country. It also records that the king passed away in 681 and his body was buried in the great rock in the East Sea. The Samgong Yusa further records that the king was believed to have become a dragon by his descendants. The rock enshrining his remains was called Dewangam, meaning rock of great king and the place where the king's manifestation as a dragon was later witnessed was named Igyonde. Mm. 
As I have argued elsewhere, the record from the monastery quoted in the above passage, for example, uh, I go, above passage was most likely an inscription from Kamunsa that was available to the monk Idion for his compilation of the Samguk Yusa in the 13th century. Although the date of this lost inscription is unknown, remaining archaeological data suggest that the legend of King Mumu's dragon incarnation already existed during the reign of son, his son, King Shinmun. The archaeological excavation conducted at the Kamunsa Monastery in 1959 found that the golden hall of the monastery had a unique underground space made of stone with a height of 60 centimeters. So, uh, this is the uh, remaining, remaining stone bases of the monastery's Buddha hall or the golden hall. And many of the stones are gone, but originally uh, the entire span of the hall was covered with this, this kind of stone. And under those stones, there was an uh, underground space about uh, this high. And no other monastery in Korea had similar underground spon uh, stone space. Uh, okay. Archaeologists could not identify any practical function of this strange underground space, and they concluded that it was probably the space recorded in the Samguk Yusa, which was prepared by King Shimun in order to invite the dragon incarnation of King Mumu to the monastery. In addition, based on the excavation results, architectural historian Kim Young-wook suggested that the space under the main hall was originally connected to the East Sea by an underground passageway that was linked to the monastery's middle gate and then to the pond outside the monastery and ultimately to the East Sea waterway. Oh. There are also archaeological remains of Igyande and Tewangam or the Rock of Great King. The Kamunsa Monastery site is located at the mouth of the Taejong River and stone foundations of Igyeonde were found in 1970 on a hilly site by the seashore where the uh, Taejong River meets the where the Taejong River meets the East Sea. From this Igyeonde site one can see the Rock of Great King in the ocean. It was at this site that the cremated ashes of the King Mummo were enshrined. The surviving steely fragments commemorating King Mummo, which was erected around a, uh, 682, also records that the king's body was cremated according to Buddhist practice, and then his ashes were scattered on the ocean. In order to understand the visual program of the Kamunsa reliquary set, we need to read between the lines of the above passage from the Samguk Yusa. It implies that the king's wish to be reborn as a dragon was regarded to be an enormous sacrifice. In the passage, the monk Jiyui expresses his worries for King Mumo because a dragon, however powerful, was merely one kind of animal and incarnation not seem to be a desirable path in Buddhism. In spite of this, in order to defend his country, the king remains determined to be reincarnated as a dragon. Although the historical validity of the details of this record cannot be confirmed, these details can be regarded as uh, revelatory of the concern and sympathy felt for the sacrificial king, feelings that may have been shared by his contemporaries and descendants. By observing all these, one can cautiously surmise that the design of the Kamunsa reliquary reflects King Shinmun's filial wish to send his father's soul to the Buddhist paradise once the country had become stabilized. Since King Mumu's dragon incarnation was believed to come to the Kamunsa from the Rock of Great King located in the East Sea, 
the king's dragon incarnation, according to this imagined flight, was supposed to visit the East's reliquary first to confirm the safeguarding of his country. And then, once the country was firmly secured, it would be carried by a bird to the Western Pure Land, represented by the Western reliquary. In short, while the East Reliquary is related to state protection, the West Reliquary represents the Western Pure Land. Okay. Thus far, we have examined meaning and function of Twin Pagodas in Korea in local context. The comparative examination of the archaeological data from the Kamunza Monastery site and the relevant historical record and local legend may also illuminate the synthetic uh, nature of early Korean religious thought. The Buddhist monuments of Kamunsa not only reflect Buddhist thoughts from the perspective of pure land Buddhism and state protection Buddhism, but may also reflect Confucian ethical values and influence of indigenous shamanism. If the design of the monastery and its twin pagodas were partly initiated out of King Shimun's wish to send his father to the Western Pure Land, this may be part of his political strategy to express his filial piety of Confucian ideas. And it may not be a simple coincidence that King Shinmun completed the construction of Kamunsa in the same year that he established the Kukak, the Lawyer Confucian Academy, whose core curriculum consisted of the Analects and the Book of Filial Piety. Beyond this, the importance of the dragon in the legend of King Mumu may reflect a synthesis between early Korean Buddhism and shamanism, because dragons had been important object of worship in indigenous Korean religion. Okay, thank you for listening to my lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs>